Welcome to the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to give you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started, I want to let you know about this episode's sponsor. Look, if there is one thing every guest on the show would agree on, it's that we all need to eat more greens, veggies, and fruit. But we get it. Look, choosing, shopping for, chopping, and prepping, and cooking all of these ingredients is hard, and it can be time-consuming and expensive. And that's why I'm so excited about Ambro Greens, the latest product from a company I have been using for a long time, Amber Night. Amber Greens is the easiest, tastiest way to enjoy your daily greens, veggies, and berries, gives you increased energy, helps control cravings and curb hunger, and strengthens gut health and immunity. Now, I have partnered with Amber Night to give you an absolutely insane deal. They want you to try this product for five days because they know that you will absolutely love it and become a lifelong user. And so if you visit ambronite.com slash superhuman, you can get a five-day pack of Ambro Greens for just $9.90. That's A-M-B-R-O-N-I-T-E dot com slash superhuman. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to this week's episode, which was lovingly handcrafted for you all, thanks to a wonderful review from And Ba of Canada, who says, awesome content, five stars. Thanks for putting out so much great content. Jonathan, I love what you do and hope to become a super learner sooner rather than later. 100% recommended. Well, thank you very much, And Ba, for your wonderful review. It totally brightened my day. On to today's episode, ladies and gents. Today, we are joined by Eric Partiker. He was named CEO of the year at the 2019 Business Excellence Awards, one of the top 30 entrepreneurs in the UK and among Britain's 27 most disruptive entrepreneurs by The Telegraph. His work has been featured in over seven major TV stations, The Wall Street Journal, Economist. He was also a guest judge on The Apprentice and on and on and on and on. Why have an entrepreneur on the show? Well, Eric's other business is that he helps entrepreneurs and leaders perform at their best through his high-performance coaching. He's one of 300 people in the world certified as a high-performance coach by the High Performance Institute, and he's completed certification with BJ Fogg, who leads Stanford University's Behavioral Design Lab. Now, over the last 20 years, he's advised Fortune 50 CEOs at McKinsey. He helped build Skype into a multi billion dollar success story and founded Chilongo, which is the most exciting fast food company of the decade, according to Elite Business Magazine, and the most successfully crowdfunded restaurant chain in the world. So, I wanted to sit down with Eric after being introduced to him by Ollie Richards because he has a very unique perspective on high performance and how we can achieve it. I know every single one of us in the audience would love to be at a higher performance level, and I love Eric's approach, as you'll see throughout the podcast. So it's a great conversation, very wide-ranging, and I think you'll see why he and I hit it off every time we hang out. So please enjoy this conversation with Eric Partiker. Mr. Eric Partaker, how are you, my friend? I am doing fabulous because it's another rainy day in London. And uh, yeah, I, um, I'm great no matter what the environment is. Fantastic. <laughs> Aren't you so glad you escaped uh, Swedish weather for English weather? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Incredible. Well, I'm really excited to chat with you today because we uh, soul bonded and mind melded in London over burritos at one of your many restaurants. And uh, and at the time, you were embarking on this path of uh, of getting into coaching and coaching other people and creating results for them. And that business has just blown up for you uh, in the last. I think 10 months since we spoke and gone from zero to a seven figure business, which I think is just a testament to uh, when you talk about this high performance stuff, you really mean it. (laughs) So tell the audience a little bit before we get wrapped up, since they didn't have the benefit of of sitting over burritos with you, a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so if you would have told me 20 years ago, I would have been doing this. Um, I would have absolutely laughed, but I guess it's a uh, perfect testament to, um, you know, John Lennon's uh, quote, 
life is what happens while we're busy making other plans. And so what I mean is um, um, I started off in uh, consulting. So I worked for McKinsey and Company, advising Fortune 50 CEOs for a few years um, in, uh, in the Chicago office and then transferred over to Scandinavia to um, spend some time with my family there. And then from there, I um, uh, uh, joined Skype in its uh, very, very early days, um, helped scale that company up from you know the, the handful of people uh, that we were in the London office up to over 500 people uh, in the space of like two, three years uh, before its exit to eBay for a couple, uh, uh, about two and a half billion. And then, um, and then uh, uh, left Skype and decided, well, I was, I was missing Mexican food and um, thought, well, let's create the restaurant that doesn't exist in London, Chilango. So it took a lot of the principles that I had learned from Skype in terms of product quality, rapid iteration, uh, wrapping things up in a brand that people love. And um, yeah, I started Chilango and um, that has blossomed into the public favorite in the UK uh, you know, for Mexican food and also became the world's most successfully crowdfunded uh, restaurant chain in the process as well. So we're literally you know, not only backed by the people on a day-to-day basis at, at lunch and dinner time, but also uh, with their, their wallets financially. And then the thread throughout all of that has been this obsession with high performance, this obsession with Abraham Maslow's quote that only 1% of people realize their full potential in life. And that was an obsession that almost cost me my life in the first 10 years of the last 20, and I'm happy to go into that. Um, but then um, uh, through a process of marginal gains and getting things right, uh, you know, it became uh, the journey that has led to where I am today, which is um, now this, this coach, you know, this high-performance coach helping other people reach their full potential with clients, including CEOs, founders, and even operatives in the the u.s special forces incredible and i have so many different areas that i want to dive into but i want to ask the obvious question how does one almost lose their life with an obsession at at being better (laughs) yeah so um so now what i teach uh whether it's to ceos founders or you know elite folks in the military is high performance is is you know reaching that one percent, but without it costing your health and relationships. So doing it in a, a very very well rounded way. My approach to uh, high performance in the first kind of ten of the last twenty years was uh, work and achieve at all costs, and um, it, it wore me down and it it, it culminated uh, in a return um, trip from. Uh, France to the UK after a bit of business, and um, my colleague uh, was on on the plane with me. We were thirty five thousand feet up in the air, and I started to feel very very unwell. He noticed it, jumped over, ran to a stewardess. A stewardess came over, looked at me, um, didn't like what she saw. Uh, thank for thankfully for me, a doctor on board asked answered her call for for help. And um, he ran over, and the last last thing I really remember him saying is, we need to emergency land the plane. Um, I think he's having a heart attack. And uh, the plane landed. Um, and luck, you know, the paramedics were there. They had shut down the runway, and and um, and you know they got me in time. I I got into the ambulance, and the paramedics. It gave me nitrates, opened up all the, the arteries. And and I remember looking up, and I'll never forget it. Um, I remember looking up at the paramedic. And this is when the truth comes out in moments like this. This is when you cut through all the crap and you, you really see what's important to you. Because the only thing that I said in that moment was, please don't let me die. I have a five-year-old son. Um, and, um, and he said, he said, well, uh, you're, you're, you're lucky. 
because we got you in time. And uh, the next morning, as you can imagine, as I woke up in that French hospital, led to a lot of soul searching. And, you know, I asked myself, you know, what am I doing on this constant, you know, achievement hamster wheel uh, that's literally coming at the price of, you know, my health and, you know, my friendships, uh, you know, the relationship with my colleagues, you know, my relationships, everything was being sacrificed in the spirit of high performance directed solely at work. And and it almost cost me my life. And uh, and by the way, I just want to add that I had a, um, a final uh, cardiology appointment about four months ago. And, uh, and the doctor said, I don't know what you've been doing, but if we were to, you know, share your records with, with anyone else, and if anyone else were to look at your heart, they'd see absolutely no evidence of any prior trauma, uh, you know, n- n- no damage whatsoever. So whatever you've been doing, you know, keep doing it because it's led to, you know, some good results. But, you know, going back to that, you know, that, that hospital moment. Um, so yeah, that, that mortality experience made me, and it wasn't, it wasn't just a, the flip of a switch. I, it didn't immediately, you know, become better, but it was the start of a journey, a start of, in the British, you know, cycling lore of marginal gains, a start of further tweaking and optimizing how I was showing up on the work front, but also doing it on the health and the home fronts so mm-hmm. that I was, mm-hmm. yeah, becoming the best version of me, but, but very, very holistically. How old were you at the time? So I was 34 years old. Yeah, 34 wow. years old, nine years That's... ago. That's quite impressive to have a cardiac event at 34 years old. <laughs> yeah, impressive is a really nice way of selling it. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, it's, uh, yeah, and, and, and it shows you that, you know, we have to be really careful with how attracted we are to these, these stories, for example, of, you know, Elon Musk working 120 hours a week, sleeping under his desk and... Be really, really careful because there's anomalies everywhere, and um, um, you know we we have to be careful what yeah what we sign up for because it could come at um, literally quite grave consequences. Absolutely, and and I completely agree with you. I think that uh, this this beating yourself into submission and trying to achieve what you want by force it's a young man's game <laughs> and yeah. it, it, we all have to go through it. Some of us discover that it's not the way some people don't discover it, but I also realized, you know, that, that small and steady change and, and more importantly, self-compassion for the small and steady change are so much more effective. Oh, absolutely. And self-compassion is, is, is a, you know, is a great one there too, because how many times, to all the audience members, you know, to this this amazing podcast, are, are they of the type that beat themselves up for not achieving enough quickly enough, or you know, fast enough? And um, and if you just practice a little bit more gratitude and appreciation and acknowledgement on a daily basis of the things that went well, instead of the things that you hadn't achieved or didn't mm-hmm. get to your results, you know, skyrocket. That's one of the core practices, by the way, that I do every single day and encourage my clients to do as well is I break my uh, journal into a win and a learn section. And every day I'm trying to record some wins. They could be work-related, health-related, relationship-related, and then also including some, some learns, you know. So what could I have done better? What needs some work? Um, and that's, you know, that's part of practicing self-compassion. I love that. I love that. And it, it's, it reminds me a lot of Dan Sullivan and this idea of, you know, either the gap or the gain, right? Are you looking at what you didn't achieve or the progress that you did make? And also he has this great tool called the, the you know, positive focus win streak kind of thing where every day you're recording your wins. It's just so much easier to motivate yourself to do more when you're focusing on the gain that you've already made as opposed to the gap. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we can play with the word gap too, because I mean, that's a, that's a great, a great segue to, um, 
what I see as as my superpower, if you will, which is, um, you know, helping. I like to help people close the gap between who they are and who they're capable of being such that, you know, the best version of them can show up more consistently, not just on the work front, but also on the health and the home fronts. And, you know, that starts with being a lot more intentional about, well, who is it that you want to be? What does that best version of you look like? How do they show up in the world? And doing that on a daily basis so that if you have something higher to be shooting for, then you're much more aware of where you're actually playing. And then therefore, you're much more able to then close that gap, you know, whether it's proactive or reactive, depending on what's going on. But, um, you know, that management of the gap, you know, such that over time, your, your highs become higher and your, your, your lows become higher than, than previous highs. You know, that's, that's, that's to me what it, what it's all about. It's, it's this jagged uh, highs and lows, up and down throughout the day, every day, day after day, but generally trending upwards as we get better and better and better little by little. I really love that. So what what are some of the tools? You mentioned journaling, which I love. Benjamin Hardy got me into journaling after years and years and years of podcast guests talking about their journaling practice. He finally sold me on it, so I love journaling. Uh, what are the practices are you and your are are you having do with your clients? Having your clients do, <laughs> having mm-hmm. your clients do that is is helping with this slow and steady progress. Because I imagine, Eric, the the typical type of person who comes to you is this type A. I'm just going to do it all. I'm going to force myself, and I won't sleep, and it'll be fine, and I can handle it. And so, so how does how do we introduce that into our lives? This new mindset. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, of course, you will, uh, without doubt, have talked about similar tools or perhaps even tools of the same nature. So, you know, this is just my kind of flavor of it and my kind of 80-20, you know, what are the 20% of tools that can deliver 80% of the benefit? So it's, I, I just want to make this clear that this is a way, it's not the way. Um, and, um, my way or some of the techniques that I, I, I train in is first, I, I start with intentionality. It all identity based change combined with outcome based change will outperform outcome based change alone. Meaning if somebody just wants to lose some weight and they just focus on that result, they're not going to perform as well as another group working alongside them with the same weight loss goal, but then who also decides Who is the person that is already achieving that, that shows up in the gym in that way and then steps into being that person on a daily basis? They will outperform the outcome-based group only. Um, So on that note, um, I have people focus on three domains from an identity point of view on a daily basis. And I refer to it as uh, enrolling your dream team. Or creating your dream team. And I do this every single day. You don't need to go through each day alone. You, you actually have three guardian angels if you want to you know, take it from a religious point of view. Or um, you know, three, three, three uh, alter egos um, that you can enlist for support. So uh, the key areas end up being your health or energy, um, your work, and then your relationships or love. And within each, I ask my clients to set an identity at the start of the day. So what is the best version of you in the context of that day? You know, how you need to be showing up in the context of that day within that domain. What does that version of you look like? Give it a name. It could be another persona that you want to hijack for the day and step into. So, for example, sometimes when I go to the gym, it's not me going to the gym. It's David Goggins showing up. And um, when I'm working out, you know, it's it's David doing the sets, not me. And that's incredibly powerful when you can tap into that other identity. Right. So it's the alter so, ego effect. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, pick an identity for each. Write some values or how, how does that person show up in the day? Uh, and then write just one thing that I refer to as like a champion proof. One thing such that if you did that, an action or behaved in that way, it would be the mathematical proof, if you will, 
of that identity having shown up in that day. So very, very quick examples. Um, I'm dynamic with this, but I also have like a, a static set that I kind of go to in the absence of uh, having anything dynamic for the day. So my static set will say world fitness champion for energy, uh, world's best coach um, within work, and then world's best husband and father within um, relationships or love. Um, within uh, world's best uh, world fitness champion, I might write as some virtues, you know, relentless, pain-seeking, uh, varied in my approach. And then depending on the workout for the day, you know, it might be something like uh, uh, burn 700 calories, you know, on the bike. Um, world's best coach, uh, I might write fast, focused, bold. And then my number one for the day might be, you know, an absolutely killer kickoff session with whoever, um, you know, might be the client that I'm starting work with on that day. And then with the world's best husband and father, I might write something like, how am I going to be warm, you know, loving, smiling? My number one for the day might be something as simple as taking time, you know, to have that coffee with my wife. But I go into the day with clear identities work-wise, health-wise, relationship-wise, in the three domains that are the 80-20, if you will, of living a good life, and know how those identities, they have names, how they're going to show up values-wise, and what's the number one thing each of that those members of my dream team could do, such that by doing it, I'm proving that I'm stepping into a better version of myself. So that's one of the key practices that I train in. All right, let's take a quick pause and thank this episode's sponsor, Blue Blocks Blue Light Blocking Glasses, the only blue light blocking company in the world that create evidence-backed lenses for filtering blue and green light. Their Australian lab-built lens technology is fitted into the most fashionable frames, and they can even make prescription and reading glasses in their optics lab. So whether you want to wear their Sleep Plus glasses that block 100% of blue and green light, their Summer Glow Mood Booster glasses, or even blue light computer glasses that don't have a yellow tint, Blue Blocks has you covered. Now, I like to wear wear the Sleep Plus glasses two to three hours before bed, and they really, really help your sleep. I also like to wear the daytime ones for reducing digital eye strain, headaches, and lowering stress. Now, Blue Blocks has free and fast worldwide shipping, and if you use code SUPERHUMAN at checkout, you can get 15% off any pair that you want. Just go to blueblocks.com, that's B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com, and enter code SUPERHUMAN to save 15%. All right, let's get back to the episode. I really love that. And I recently had a chance to interview the author of The Alter Ego Effect. And I found this whole thing to be so fascinating that the world's most elite performers all do this. They do exactly what you're saying. They step into a different persona. Uh, and I also want to touch on, on, you said something important where, you know, like people may have heard some of these ideas. And I think a lot of times people think, oh, you know, that that somehow it reduces the value of of what is to follow. But I actually think the opposite. I think the more and more you discover people like yourself who are doing the same thing, that doesn't mean, okay, this is old news, you know, write it off. It means, okay, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, I've now heard of 15 different people who do this, who talk about the same things, whether it's meditation or getting a good night's sleep. It's like just a reminder of how important it is and you should pay more attention to it And the other thing I'll add is like, okay, cool. Almost every episode, we talk about some form of mindfulness, but there are still a huge proportion of people in the audience right now who haven't meditated yet today or this week or this month. And so it's like the advice is good and you're hearing it every week. The the real question is, are you doing it? And sometimes the, the first time you encounter an idea, it's not enough. As I said, like I've been told about journaling for years, if not decades, And yet it wasn't until Ben Hardy explained the way that he does it, which is pretty similar to the way that you do it, I think, where I was like, okay, yeah, now it clicks. Now I get it. Same thing with meditation, right? I tried for years and years and years, and I had an okay meditation practice, but I was by no means fully committed until I did TM. And I was like, oh, I I could do this every day. This this is actually pretty addictive for me as opposed to, you know, breath work. So, so yeah, I, I, I no longer... 
uh, and I'm not saying you were apologizing, but I no longer apologizing for ap- apologize for repeating advice that people have heard a thousand times because it's sound, and yet still so many people aren't doing it. So, and and I, you know, I, I when you that. just said that, yeah, and when you just said that, you just reminded me of something. It's it's a pet peeve of mine, and, it, and when I hear it, I you know literally want to like reach through the phone and give the person a crack, and it's uh, it's it, it goes along the lines of you provide some advice or a way in which somebody can help close that gap between who they are, who they're capable of being. And in response, you hear something back like, yeah, yeah, yeah I know that. Oh yeah. yeah I, 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 I understand. Yeah. I know all about that. And you know what? Knowing what to do, you know, anybody can Google what to do in seconds. So knowing what to do, especially in this day and age, that's not where the game is played. It's irrelevant. It's like, and even mentioning that you know 100%. what to do. Yeah, and mentioning that you know what to do in the absence of having taken action is is actually, you know, it, it hurts you, if anything. You know, the game is played and can take, you know, taking consistent action. And so what I often have to do is not allow any of my clients to ever utter those words, yeah, yeah, I know this. Because the moment they do that, it's almost like they're giving themselves a bit of credit. And then that hurts their ability to actually take action. Right. I've started telling people information without implementation can't create transformation. And it's, we all, you know, we all know we shouldn't be eating sugary foods. It's like, say what you want about paleo, keto, you know, diets that are still controversial. We all know we shouldn't be eating so much sugar. And yet the average person has dessert at least once a day. It's like, you you don't need to be eating Mm -hmm. a brownie, you know, or, or French toast for breakfast. And yet people are doing it every single day. So it's like, we would all have six pack abs and be billionaires if information were all it took. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And, and that by the way is, is, uh, credit is due to Derek Sivers for that one. That's a quote of his, um, which is why I want to ask you uh, about coaching. You know, I've worked with, uh, mentors many times in my life. I now have, uh, various different business coaches that I work with, uh, in London, which is actually why you and I get to hang out periodically. Um, Mm -hmm. Talk to me about coaching and and what the role of a coach is as you see it. Yeah, great. So I've I've had the benefit of having coaching throughout um, most of um, most of my professional career in the various roles that I've had, and this obsession with entering that one percent club, you know, reaching your full potential, um, as as Abraham Maslow, you know, had pointed out. One of the common commonalities that I, th- I saw in mastery of anything was not only the deliberate practice element, you know, working very, very hard uh, with a degree of, you know, intellectual you know, strain on whatever it is you're trying to improve or if it's physical uh, as well. But n- n- not only that, but also having this coach element. And we see this in sports we see it in the music and arts and what a lot of people don't realize is that it's very very present in business as well in fact if you look at the google founders eric schmidt steve jobs and a bunch of other uh, ceos uh, in silicon valley companies that they all had a coach and in fact uh, they all shared the same coach the late bill campbell so you know coaching provides both camaraderie I'd say uh, that that support, especially it's it's tough being an entrepreneur. You, you, you feel lonely, you know, in your work. You often don't have people that you can bounce ideas off of as readily as you would like. You you know might feel you're doing a lot of busy work and not enough work on what matters most. So you have that camaraderie there that makes it feel less alone in the journey. But then also challenge um, people who are at the very very top. Um, and you know, the perfect evidence would be, uh, some of the special forces guys I'm, I'm working with. You would think, okay, these guys don't need a coach. They're the epitome of discipline. They, they are one percenters, but we all, the fact that even the best need a coach shows you that, well, if the best need it, then what about everyone else? You know, coaching gives you that camaraderie and challenge, that support and that push to keep you going and keep you, you know, achieving whatever it is you're, you know, you're, you, you've set out to achieve. Now, my particular flavor of coaching is that I think there's two types of coaches out there. And I do not think one is better than the other. I think that they're just different. And it's up to the person to have a preference. So if we look at sports, 
you'll find coaches who have never played the game and they're great, fantastic world-class coaches. And you'll find coaches who have played the game and they're also great world-class coaches. Now I gravitate towards people who have been in this same trenches that, you know, I continue to fight in, you know, I'm still CEO of, of Chilango and this coaching work that I do is, you know, runs alongside of that. So, you know, within, within the coaching that I'm doing, I'm, you know, bringing in the, the McKinsey, um, you know, experience, uh, the rapid scaling at Skype and that whole founder to, um, uh, well, actually, CEO of the year was uh, the accolade that I uh, that I scooped earlier this year. But that whole founder to CEO journey um, at Chilango. So trying to bring you know coaching that camaraderie and challenge together with some real world experiences that relate to the person being coached. I love that, and I don't know how you feel about this. I'm curious to hear M- my take on it and and we just were i'm in the process of training 26 coaches uh, certified coaches for our super learner program and the stance i took with them was it's not your job as a coach to teach people material it's your job as a coach to remind people to bring them into alignment to hold them accountable to help them set goals and challenge themselves because again it's it's the information anyone can accumulate you're there to assure that the information is met with implementation. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the thing that I would add, which is what I try to do with my clients, is uh, coaching. What, what I like coaching to not be is linear. I don't want to offer a linear improvement to the person that I'm working with. Instead, what I like to do is maybe change the questions that they think they should be asking of themselves into even more powerful questions that they didn't even know they should be asking of themselves such that they reach an insight about their life or their future or their performance that they never would have reached or discovered without that coaching relationship. So I like it to be very, very insight driven. Right. And to challenge them. Ultimately, you're there Mm -hmm. to challenge them. Exactly. I love that. Exactly. I love that. Now, Eric, we, uh, we're not quite running up on time, but there are a bunch of questions that I want to ask you because you are a super high performance human being. And I always love to suss out and see what, what we have in common and what you have in common with, um, with past guests. So I'd love to give people some homework assignments for this week's episode. What's one thing that people could do, uh, before next week's episode, uh, to implement on what they've learned today? Well, okay. So Um, what I would say is go start building your dream team on a daily basis across energy, work and love or health, uh, you know, business relationships, however you want to refer to it at the start of each day, pick an identity. What is, what's the name, whether it's another individual or just a phrase for yourself, what does that best version of you look like? How does that best version of you behave? Uh, values wise. And then what's one thing you could do such that by doing it, you would prove that you have stepped into that version of you. So do that on a daily basis and see what happens if you maintain a streak of 90 days there with, you know, with your performance. Totally awesome. Totally awesome. What are some other skills, habits, or routines that you feel make you perform at a higher level? One is I have a lot of clarity about what separates professional from an amateur. So um, I, I, these phrases constantly go, re- revolve around my head, and and I you know I share them and remind them uh, you know, to my clients. So uh, classic way I define a professional versus an amateur is that professionals take action whether they feel like it or not, because I hear way too often when people aren't writing the book that they want to write when they aren't improving public speaking in the way that they want to, when they're not doing X, Y, Z, an ABC area of life, they'll often say, well, I just didn't really feel like it. And feeling needs to be taken out of the equation. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter because actually research shows that action and behavior is a better predictor of how you're going to feel rather than waiting for a feeling to spontaneously happen to inspire action or behavior. So, you know, 
take action, whether you feel like it or not. And then going even a step further, you know, into high performance is the worse you feel, the more committed you are to doing what needs to be done. So if you wake up on the wrong side of bed and you don't feel like going to the gym, and if the past amateur version of you would then give you a get out of jail free card and say, you know what, you've been good. You deserve some time off. That right there is your signal to step in to that discomfort and say, I don't feel like going to the gym today. And that's now a signal that tells me I absolutely must go. So I, I would I would really embrace what it means to be a pro versus an amateur. See where the amateur version of you is showing up in life and start taking a professional attitude to remedy that. Now, I have a tough question for you that I struggle with all the time, which is how do you balance that with the self-compassion, with not beating yourself up and not forcing yourself and, and knowing? Because one of the things I've learned over, over the years is when to know that it's enough and as high performance as you are, you also need to be uh, kind of, how do I phrase this? You have to know how to take quality rest and recovery. So how do you balance this? I need to perform whether or not I want to with the idea of cutting yourself some slack, being self-compassionate and, and giving yourself the rest you deserve. That's a great question. And this is where it becomes you know, the, the, the mixture of art and science. And this is where coaching helps you toe that line uh, because it isn't you know, so completely uh, black and white. Um, so it all needs to happen within reason. So, of course, if you're sick and if you're ill, going to the gym in this example is going to be a stupid move. Um, if you've only slept five hours, going to the gym is going to be a stupid move once again so provided that your fundamentals are in place you got your eight hours of sleep you are not ill and it's more just this feeling of oh i don't wanna you know that's that's what you got to look for because really it's that's the feeling that's the culprit here it's it's very rarely that you're genuinely sick that's not what's keeping you from your goals you know, it's 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 usually it's the person is just just not taking consistent action during those gray zone periods where they sort of want to, but they're not sure and they're just not feeling the vibe. You know, that that's what right. I'm talking about. I love that. I love that. And, and it's so true, right? It, they say all knowledge comes from knowledge of self and you need to develop the knowledge to know when it's one and when it's the other. And you need to know when when your body is is the one responding negatively to doing work versus just you know your mind mm -hmm. exactly Love exactly that. eric what's one product or service you simply couldn't live without well <laughs> you know what i'm gonna say but it's it's the absolute truth it's um it's coaching because you don't know what you don't know you can't see what you can't see and um i've you know used a I have both a business and a life uh, coach that I've used for um, years. It said in my own story, I, I, I think it's dangerous to separate business from life. So my only kind of upgrade, if you will, on that is that I combine the business and life coaching together for my clients. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, but definitely coaching. Love that. Love that. What are some books that have completely changed your life? So I used to be a horrible procrastinator, like, like really, you know, I'm not talking about, I didn't want to sit down to do my taxes, like horrible things like that. I'm, I'm talking about, I would have difficulty just sitting still for 30 minutes to work on a simple presentation. Um, I ended up reading a book called the now habit, which was, uh, which is written by a guy named Neil Fiore. I got so inspired by the book, it's a program to overcome procrastination, that I ended up reaching out to Neil, and I did 16 uh, coaching sessions with him to kind of fully embed everything that I had learned. Um, but yeah, that, that book turned me from a procrastinator to a super producer, um, but again, without sacrificing um, you know, the things that are important in life. So that's one. The other book is The One Thing. Um, incredibly powerful for me. The thing that I really latched onto in there was this quote that 
the price for multitasking versus single tasking is on average a 28% loss of the average worker's day. And I took that 28% and I scaled that up, you know, mathematically and realized that that equals 13 weeks, work, work weeks in a calendar year. And then that led to the further insight that, wow, so this means that the average person, because of their distractibility, is only playing with three quarters in the year. And so when I, what I tell my clients is, what if we can add an extra 13 weeks to your year? Would you like that competitively? Would you like that to spend more time with your families? How would you use 13 weeks a year? And then when we further scale that up, you know, I say, how would you use an extra 10 years of life? What do you want to use that towards? So those those two books, The Now Habit and The One Thing, were incredibly impactful for, for me. Incredible. Incredible. All right. I, I actually haven't heard of either of those books, which is great. It's, it's amazing to me that after 250-something episodes, I'm still discovering books that are really uh, impacting people's lives and, and are so seemingly valuable. So I'm going to mm-hmm. add those to my Goodreads. What's one thing, Eric, that you believe that other people think is crazy? One thing that I believe that other people think is crazy. I wouldn't say all people believe this, but I've certainly met a lot of people who believe it. And my belief is that you literally can do whatever the hell you want in life, like literally whatever you want. Um, Again, I did not think I would go from consulting to, you know, helping build a a unicorn to running a chain of Mexican restaurants to, you know, helping people become one percenters. I mean, it's such an eclectic, you know, it's like if, if that was turned into an, you know, clothing or an outfit for a person, it would be such a mismatch of different things. (laughs) So, you know, you can literally do whatever you want because you can learn whatever you want. We're capable of learning whatever we want. Our brain is so malleable. It's so, you know, you can literally program yourself to do anything if you just take the time in your day to build, you know, learning in. Focus on the highest value things within whatever that area is you want to, you know, get smart in. You know, the the highest value things that will move the needle learning-wise. And then number three, surround yourself with sages. There's a lot of gray hair wisdom out there, some of which isn't even gray haired. And if you just tap yourself into that, plug into it, you know, you can get the baton passed in the relay of relay race of life such that you're not having to start from, you know, the starting line each time. Brilliant. Eric, where can people reach out and uh, learn more and get in touch with you? If you go to ericpartaker.com, that's the best place to go. And uh, for a couple of reasons. One, if you're an entrepreneur or a founder and you really want to transform yourself into a you know, world-class CEO, again, without sacrificing your health or relationships, then, um, then definitely uh, you know, pay me a visit there because uh, there's a conversation to be had. And then um, uh, more generally, if, you, if you're just looking to scale yourself up, again, more holistically, a new course coming out in the new year where I'll be teaching all of my principles around high performance in a more kind of group setting um, for those that are, you know, not not interested in a one-on-one relationship, but still interested in in improving. Brilliant. And Eric, before I let you go and and thank you for your time and sharing your wisdom with us today, I always wrap the podcast with one question, which is people who are listening, if they take away one big message from this episode and they carry it with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that to be? It's up to you to decide who you want to be. It's up to you to be super honest with yourself about where you are. And it's up to you to reach out and get the help that you need to close that gap so that when you reach the end, you do it without regret, knowing that you become part of that 1% club, part of those that feel they realized you know, their fullest potential in business and life. Fantastic. Eric, thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing your wisdom. And I I hope we get to hang out again next time I'm in London. Yeah, likewise. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Take care. 
Thanks for tuning in to the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast. For more great skills and strategies, or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit superhuman.blog. While you're at it, please take a moment to share this episode with a friend and leave us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next week.